Most people in the Virgin Islands love eating fish. However, every once in a while, we're suffering from the occasional fish poisoning, or what is scientifically called secret terror. We spoke with some fishermen to discuss secret terror and how climate change may make a difference in its frequency. Fish poisoning, medically known as cigatara, is common in cultures that depend on warm tropical seas for their livelihood. We asked some fishermen for their thoughts. Well, the best way, I think, is to prevent from being fish poison is being knowledgeable of the fish that do poison. The highest risk fish for fish poisoning uh, are barracudas, horse-eye jacks, uh, black jacks, kubera snapper, and and there's some area uh, distribution of fish poisoning. The fish on the north are uh, generally poison free and the ones on the south, some of them on the south are more risky. The classic is the, uh, what they call locally the Kerang or the barjack, which doesn't poison on the north, but is a highly risky fish if caught from the south. To me, there's, there's some kind of signatoria more on the south side than on the north side of the island. Most of the fish I eat from poison is come from the south. On the south side, it's like kingfish barracuda, certain snappers. People shouldn't sell fish that they know has a possibility of poison. I, I was here in the 70s and 80s, and it seemed to me that there was more fish poisoning then than there is now. But now, since like people are more knowledgeable that certain fish poison, that's the fish that they basically watch out for. The fishermen do look out for the public trying not to sell the fish that are poisoned, but any fish can poison. He got a sun snapper. We're accustomed to poison. I catch hundreds of pounds. They never do nothing. Somebody else gonna cause one, and that's it. People have gotten poison from old wife, hind, because no two persons' body chemistry is the same. Five people might eat from one fish and one get poisoned, four don't. You know, any fish can poison. But basic, basically certain like barracuda, kingfish, snappers, cavalli, on the south side is what you gotta watch out for. Ciguatero fish poisoning is caused by a small one-cell alga called a dinoflagellate, which is actually related to seaweeds. It is called Gambiodiscus toxicus, and it lives attached to other seaweeds, to coral rubble, and sand on the ocean bottom. The toxin or poison it produces moves up the food chain, starting with the fish that eat the dinoflagellate and ending with the human who eats the fish. As it turns out, cooking does not destroy the toxin in the fish, and you can't tell by looking whether it is healthy or not. Nick, as an environmental specialist at UVI, let me ask you why, there are some, why some areas have dinoflagellates and some do not. Well, as you said, uh, Dr. Ragster, the dinoflagellate attaches itself to, it's a very tiny organism. It attaches itself to the marine algae, to seaweeds. And also, it, it attaches itself to the rubble, as you said. Um, this species, like many marine species, has a very complex set of requirements in order to flourish and to thrive. And we don't totally understand what this complex set of uh, requirements are in order for this dinoflagellate to thrive in our environment. Certainly, as we heard from the fishermen, they seem to thrive in certain areas uh, more so than in other areas. Um, if we look across the Caribbean, for example, you will find uh, these species existing in some of the northern islands but not some of the more central islands of the Eastern Caribbean chain, and then they reoccur in some of the more southern islands. And we don't totally understand why this distribution is the way that it is. What we do know is that uh, many of these uh, marine algae, these single cellular organisms, tend to thrive in slightly elevated sea surface temperatures when the water column is uh, slightly warmer for an extended period of time, we have what we call algal blooms. When we have these algal blooms, for the fish that feed on the dinoflagellates, it's a feeding frenzy, it's open season. So then we will see more fish imbibing the toxins from the dinoflagellate, and then, of course, more fish in our, in our marine environment actually higher up the chain 
having, carrying the cigotoxin and the fish poisoning. I really appreciated your answer. Thank you, Nick. Let me make it a little bit more interesting, if I may. So now we take the conditions you speak of and we take it to a climate change scenario where the waters are warmer, coral reefs are stressed, okay, you have the possibility of more rubble in the area. What do you think people are projecting in terms of what would be happening with Ciguatera? Would you expect to see more of the dinoflagellates under those conditions or less? Absolutely. The expectation is that we will see a marked increase in the dinoflagellates. As the, the rubble, for example, as you mentioned, is moved around by extreme uh, storm events, right. there's greater distribution. You have the algal, the, uh, the seaweed, as we call it, um, being ripped from its hold fast from where it is on the reef and being distributed further. That means that the dinoflagellate that is being carried by these uh, uh, stronger t uh, currents will have the opportunity to explore different areas within the marine uh, system. And they may find that, in fact, these areas are um, mm -hmm. conducive to their reproduction and their success. So then we'll see uh, a, gra a greater distribution of um, fish that are carrying the toxin as, as these uh, extreme storm events come through. Thank you. I really appreciate your answer. Yes, Nick, we appreciate direct answers to those questions.